I mean, the the exhibition that is street that is streaming is divided into ten chapters. The first one that we're looking at is a, basically an overview um, introduction dealing with everything from uh, the different kinds of forms of execution, executing women, executing people with uh, mental disorders. This one I'm going to I'm going to describe because it has the Nike swoosh that says "Just Do It." which was um, actually this, a statement by someone on death row and they were having trouble doing the, getting the thing set up and he said, just do it. And then Nike used it as their slogan and that was quite terrifying. Um, then the next section we're looking at now are all the different ways from firing squad to electric chair to hanging. Um, so the different ways of um, to guillotine. So the different ways um, into lethal injection. I think that's, covering all of them, most of which are still done in the United States today. This next section is um, racism and poverty. Um, the, the top poster was um, them without the capital punishment means them without the capital gets the punishment. And then there's some historic images of, of lynchings and ha legalized hangings in the, in the you know, 19th century as well as today. The uh, access to counsel, a matter of life or death is the conclusion. The next section deals with political executions. Political dissenters are being charged, starting with the Haymarket uh, uh, martyrs to Joe Hill, labor organizer, is framed, Saquon Vanzetti, some very, you know, the Rosenbergs, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, so some very famous uh, political, um, political executions uh, that are still being debated today. Um, the uh, anti-apartheid executions. So these are not just the United States, they're international. Ken Sarawiwa in Nigeria, who was basically convicted and hung because he was doing ecological organizing in Nigeria and Shell Oil basically framed him. Um, you know, the next section is on wrongly convicted. How many years of lives people spent on death row who were who, for crimes they did not commit? We'll see more about that later. Um, this, the next section is religious opposition. This first poster shows a, a crucifixion. This says maybe the death penalty should have been abolished a long time ago um, and let one who was out sin cast the first stone. An eye for an eye will leave the whole world bl blind. The next section is clemency denied. And that's people that were really, we were organizing to save like Stan Tukey Williams, but that did not happen. He was executed. Uh, Troy Davis, another execution that should not have happened. I mean, none of them should have happened. Um, then there's a few that we were successful, the lives saved. You know, um, you know, Tom Mooney was pardoned. Paul Skyhorse and Richard Mohawk, activists with the American Indian Movement, were were not were not hung. Bobby Seal, another political frame up, was was not was. And then Angela Davis, of course, she's probably one of the more famous ones within the last uh, half century, and she was. Uh, release them. The, the next section is the fight continues. Um, and they, um, oh, it's stopping. I'm not seeing what the posters are, so I can't describe them. But uh, as soon as that, um, well, actually, what these are, these are ongoing fights. These are ongoing struggles about people who are still on death row that are finding, fighting to get either exonerated or new trial, uh, all of the above. And I know um, um, Mumia Bujamal and um, uh, Melissa, um, uh, Lucia, and who else is in this section, folks? You are all part of helping put this together. Kevin um, Cooper. Kevin Cooper, yes. So this is an international poster right now that's very interesting. It's about Mumia Abu Jamal, um, a letter Peltier, Native American, American Indian Movement activist. Um, Kevin Cooper, here's the Kevin Cooper poster. Uh, uh, Julius Jones. Julius Jones, and Melissa Lucio, Lucio, um, another one from Melissa, uh, Rodney Reed, and um, Tony Aponovich. And then conclusion of the exhibition, Organizing for Justice, and it shows, you know, killing for justice is injustice, um, about, and the different ways of people are organizing and fighting to, for dignity for all and for the abolition of the of the death penalty, death penalty, and um, 
One of the most intriguing was the four images of the Colosseum in Rome, which I did not know whenever the death penalty is eliminated in a state in the United States, there's a group in Rome that lights up, lights up the, the uh, Colosseum in, um, in celebration of the elimination of the death penalty in a state. So that's, that's a, basically an overview of the 10 sections of the exhibition. And we will be, um, I think we should, I think we could start now. Um, so I um, wanna welcome you all. And my name is Carol Wells and I'm the founder and executive director of the Center for the Study of Political Graphics. All of the posters in the exhibition have come from our, our, our archives. We are a, a human rights a, a human rights and poster protest poster archive. We are an activist, a research and educational archive. We produce um, many exhibitions, uh, many which are on our website. You can you can see them, and our latest exhibitions uh, for the last few years have been dealing with queer rights or human rights, posters of LGBTQ struggles and celebrations, activists, artists, and sisters posters on women fighting for justice, healthcare.wealthcare, posters on health activism and social justice, and to protect and serve five decades of posters protesting police violence. Um, if you have or make posters, please consider contacting us. We would, that's how we get posters about current issues, international issues, old new issues, new issues. So please consider donating them to us. Um, I now would like to you know, thank um, before anything else, thank our host for the exhibition, Esperanza Community Housing and Mercado La Paloma, uh, our funders, the City of Los Angeles Department of Cultural Affairs, the Los Angeles County Department of Arts and Culture, and the Getty Foundation. And I also want to let people know that in addition to the exhibition, which will be at Mercado La Paloma through the end of July, there are also two free, at least two free events that will be held in association with the exhibition. One, the first will take place on June 11th. Uh, from one to four, we're having a, a poster making workshop with artist Ernesto Vasquez. He's been leading our poster making workshops at the Mercado for at least five or six years now, and he's quite extraordinary. Uh, and then on July 9th, we will have a quilt making workshop with one of our panelists tonight, uh, Gary Tyler, who will be, um, that's also on a Saturday from one to four, but all that information is on our West website and you can see the information on that now. Now um, I'd like to introduce a very brief, a three minute clip um, by the death penalty focus um, with, with, testament, with statements by the exonerated. Sorry, folks, just needed a second. Uh... While we're waiting, I wanna thank Emily Seltzer who's making sure that all of this takes place. She's our lead archivist. I went to prison at 40 years old for 23 years for a crime I did not commit. My name is Bruce Lisker. I was sent to prison when I was 17 years old and I served 26 years for a crime I did not commit. My name is Garrett Tyler. I was sent to prison when I was 16 years old and served 41 and a half years for a crime I did not commit. My name is Jane Doratic. I was sentenced to 25 years to life for a crime that I didn't commit. I hope everyone is doing well. My name is Jerry Miller. I was sent to prison when I was 23 years old and I served 26 years for a crime I did not commit. Hi, my name is Kimberly Long. I spent seven years and three months in prison for a crime I didn't commit. My name is Nancy Bollardson, and this is one of my favorite pictures of my brother, Greg Wilboy. Greg spent five years on Oklahoma's death row for a crime he did not commit. Sadly, Greg passed away in 2014, in large part because of the damage he suffered while on death row. In memory of Greg and to honor all of his fellow death row survivors, 
We must all continue to fight to end the death penalty forever. Hi, my name is Obi Anthony. At the age of 19, I was wrongfully convicted for a murder robbery I did not commit. I served 17 and a half years. My name is Peter Pringle. I was sent to prison when I was 41 years old and served nearly 15 years in prison for a crime I did not commit. My name is Sonny Jacobs. I went to prison when I was 27 years old and I served 16 years, 233 days for a crime that I did not commit. My name is Uriah Courtney. I was sent to prison when I was 25 years old and I served eight years, four months. My name is Janet Dixon. I was arrested and sent to prison at the age of 18. I was released from prison at 58 years old. I was, originally, I was charged with the death penalty, which was later reduced to life without the possibility of parole. I went to prison for a crime I did not commit. My name is Joe Giratano, and I served almost 40 years in jail for a crime I did not commit. Together, the men and women you just heard from have lost a combined total of over 300 years of our lives in prison. If not for the strength, support, and efforts to our families, our communities, our lawyers, our organization, like Death Penalty Focus, we would have lost many, many more years, and some of us would have lost our lives. Well, if that doesn't take people's breath away, certainly I've seen it several times and every time it does not, it does not fail to impact me. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce an amazing panel. Um, I want to start, I'm going to do this alphabetically. Um, as I say your name, wave, so people know who you are. Um, Abraham Bonowitz has been opposing executions for more than 30 years. He is co-founder and executive director of Death Penalty Action, a national group shining a spotlight on executions in the United States and empowering individuals to vigorously oppose the death penalty. I'm not seeing anybody's faces. Is there any way we can get everybody's faces on here? Or is this, oh, this is the way we wanted it, right? Sorry. I, we just need to, I, I'm Abe. Okay. Um, previously a proponent of the death penalty, Abe's mind was changed after he failed to prove that capital punishment is an effective public policy. Abe's heart was changed after coming to understand the collateral damage executions impose upon communities far beyond the victim and the killer. Um, Mona Cadena works with the uh, Equal Justice USA staff and partners implementing death penalty repeal and violence reduction campaigns across the country. She uses her expertise in community-based organizing to provide training, strategic guidance, and hands-on assistance to state legislative campaigns across the country. Before joining Equal Justice USA in, um, in 2019, Mona spent 10 years with Amnesty International supporting human rights campaigners across the globe to build grassroots power, educate and implement human rights centered policy. Um, then Mike Farrell, actor, activist and producer. As an actor, he is best known as Captain PJ Hunnicutt in MASH. Uh, he has been an activist for many decades. He raised money for unions, protested the 1978 ballot measure that would have banned gay teachers from working in California schools. In the 1980s, he opposed US involvement in Central America. I think that's when we first met. Um, for more than four decades, he has worked to abolish the death penalty. Mike is president of the Board of Death Penalty Focus, one of the nation's premier abolition organizations and co-chair emeritus of Human Rights Watch California. And um, finally, Gary Tyler, uh, in April, 2016, Gary was finally released from Louisiana State Prison, Angola, notoriously Angola prison, um, after serving 41 years for a crime of murder he did not commit. In October, 1974, he was 16 years old, charged with first degree murder, tried in a, as an adult, convicted, and automatically sentenced to be executed in Louisiana electric chair. 
He was the youngest person on death row in the United States at the time and spent eight years in solitary confinement. In 1981, a federal appeals court said that Tyler was denied a fundamentally fair trial, but refused to order a new trial for him. While his death sentence was deemed unconstitutional and overturned, he remained unjustly in prison for four decades. So um, I'm going to start asking a question for all of you. Um, how did you get involved in the, in the anti-death penalty work? And Mona, Who do you want to go first? first? You go first, Abe. Go, go first. <laughs> well, I got involved because uh, I joined a group called Amnesty International, and I went to an amnesty meeting, and somebody was talking about the death penalty there, and I argued with them and said, an eye for an eye, and I'll, I'll pull the switch myself. And then I set off to try to prove them wrong. And in doing so, I found out that I was wrong. And I just kept getting more and more involved. And I'm now running the second organization that I've created and have been a part of a number of different groups um, and work and um, doing this work. And, and it's just, uh, I like to say that the, the facts changed my head, but it's meeting the people in this work and especially people like Gary and victim family members and others um, that has really changed my heart. Thank you. Mike? Sure. <clears throat> um, I'm uh, I actually, I was always opposed to the death penalty in concept. Um, and in 1972 was thrilled that the Supreme Court outlawed uh, or held unconstitutional the, the death penalty in the United States. In 76, it was reinstated and I was doing a television series at the time and um, chose to make my position on the issue uh, public. Uh, I was doing other things as well, as Carol mentioned. And, uh, you know, the news media was interested in the fact that it, the, one of the lead characters in a major television series was uh, speaking out against something like the death penalty. Um, so it was interesting, but again, it was philosophical. Um, uh, I guess I signed a petition or maybe uh, my, uh, some of my statements had been made uh, broadcast somewhere, but a minister in Tennessee who um, uh, ran an organization called the Southern Coalition on Jails and Prisons contacted me and he said, I understand you're against the death penalty. And I said, yes, that's right, I am. And he said, I need to come out and talk to you, which he did. And he said, uh, I, I need some help. I need somebody who can get press attention to this issue because we're gonna have a bloodbath in this country after the 76 decision, the Webb, the uh, Greg decision in this, from the Supreme Court that reopened the death um, cells and the death rows of our country to uh, execution. And he took me to my first death row in Tennessee. Um, and I, I, you know, a guy who opposed the death penalty um, I was subject to the same thing a lot of people are, that those people are dangerous, fang-toothed, child-eating monsters who we have to get rid of. Now, I didn't believe that was true, but I also didn't understand as I went into the Tennessee death row that I was going to see people, most of whom were black and brown, uh, most of whom were uh, uneducated, most of all of whom were impoverished. And I began to understand the death penalty on a whole different uh, level. And I began to hate it, not only for the philosophical reason that I think killing is wrong, but I hated it for the dehumanization process that the entire, in my view, criminal legal justice system, which is capped off by the death penalty um, is, uh, is run. Thank you. Ona? Thanks, Carol. For me, you know, as similar to Abe, I joined Amnesty International and I was a young, young organizer doing organizing work in Virginia, Maryland, Pennsylvania. And those were the days Virginia was executing a lot in those years. And I got a very front row seat to the impact of executions, not just on families of people, 
who were executed, but families of people who were killed, folks who were part of the system to execute people. And similar to Abe, as I started just like unpacking and unpeeling all the all the layers of the death penalty, um, it just continued to get me more uh, more and more committed to ending it. And the other piece of it for me is also healing some generational trauma. My great great grandfather was executed in Texas in the early 20th century, and as I have been doing this work, the it, this. What, what has been thought of as a deep, dark family secret has started to come out as family members have started talking to me, some, some about their memories of being told about this. Uh, and so for me, it feels both like personal and as a justice seeker uh, is why I got involved in this work. So Gary, you're coming at this from another, another angle. How do you have, how can you add to this conversation? Um, well, Considering the tragic events surrounding my life, I felt I had no other choice but to oppose the death penalty because my life was at stake at the time. And having to spend several years on death row and when the death penalty was unconstitutionally declared, uh, you could say cruel and unusual in Louisiana, and of course, it was a relief for me and many others. Later on, Louisiana reinstated the death penalty. And when they did that, I became friends of uh, the newly arrival uh, prisoners that was condemned to die, like people like Dalton Prejean, uh, Alvin Moore, and Michael Williams. And having to spend Angola for over a decade in, uh, in a prison that executed over a dozen men, it became apparent that my struggle did not cease. My struggle continued because there was an identification there that those same men who came on death row after me, that they are now being executed, although I had an execution date. So I made a promise to myself that if ever I'm released from prison, and whatever human uh, 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 capacity that I can serve to oppose the death penalty, that that would be my, my just cause. And being released from prison April the 29th, 2016, and arriving here in Los Angeles May the 13th of 2016, I was invited to death penalty focus event. And Right there, I realized that that was not only my calling, but this was a just and, and, and enable organization that can give me the ability to be able to express my opposition against the death penalty. And thanks to Mike Farrell and Steve Rohde, they gave me an opportunity to be able to express my opposition as an experienced former death row prisoner. And i never forget, this is the poster. <laughs> <laughs> yes, y'all stand on 62. And that itself, that gave me the burning desire to continue on my position against the death penalty. And thank you once again, Mike. I appreciate it very much. Bless you, Gary. All right. Mike, you, you raised the issue of class and race and education in, in the imposition of the death penalty. And I was hoping that that some of you will, will develop that idea a little bit more. Mm. Thank you. Can, Carol, can I just say, because you said it, uh, the the list of people, the exonerees, uh, I, I can almost not look at it without tears. I, I, <clears throat> I know most of them. I've been involved in many of their cases. And it's, um, they are a living testament to the ugliness and brutality and, and idiocy of the death penalty. These are people who have been tried, convicted, sentenced to death, and spent years and years and years, decades, in Gary's case, in the case of Sonia and others. Um, and it, it just simply is a, is, a, is a black mark, forgive the use of the term, um, in, in this way, but it's a, it's a real insult to the whole concept of humanity. I would just like to add that 
in, in terms of race and class, um, I mean, I constantly in doing this work, which I've been doing for more than 30 years, you get exposed to, you know, why this happens. I grew up in a middle class environment. I've always been comfortable. I've never been had my my personal existence threatened. But you know, most recently um, I've been working very hard in, with the family of Melissa Lucio, who faced execution last month in Texas. Actually April 27th was her date. But I was in Harlingen and Brownsville in Cameron County, Texas, at you know Melissa's mother's um, kitchen table and working with these people, uh, her family, and seeing the level of poverty that some people live in. And it's not, all, not just them, but in particular, how you end up on death row is when you're somebody that's seen a, as, um, as disposable. And who's disposable? People that don't have assets, people that can't walk into the court with their own attorney, people who are not white or prominent in society are more easily found. And for in Melissa's case, you know, one of the reasons why they pinned uh, a, something that an accident on her as a murder uh, was because Armando Villalobos, the man running for re-election as prosecutor, needed a win. And what better win than to send a child killer to death row, right? And the first Latina to death row in Texas. So that was a part of, I mean, it was really eye-opening for me just to, to see what happens even today. Um, I've met in this work in Oklahoma and in Texas and other places just in the last few months, people that are organizing and doing stuff uh, who don't have a driver's license because it's too expensive for them to go through all the hoops that they have to do to clear their record or to be able to get up, uh, get insurance or even own a car, uh, which, you know, some of us just can't even imagine that, but that's how people, there's a whole underclass and to this in, in our society. And, and even where I live and probably where all of us live, I mean, I can go three blocks from here and find homeless people. And that's the reality of our society. And it's those are the people that are easy to pin something on. Uh, those are the people that, that are most easy to send to death row because they're not affording their own attorneys. And, and I'll just add that that's one of the, the side notes to the Shin decision by the US Supreme Court last week, um, which basically says you can't uh, have access to bringing new evidence in the federal level uh, if if you or your attorneys did not raise evidence at the, at the state level. And who's that going to impact? <laughs> it's going to impact the people that can't afford their own attorneys. Thanks, Abe. I definitely agree. And I think to add some contours, the death penalty has been used from slavery through Jim Crow through the present day as a tool of racial terror. And I think that is very clearly evidenced in the posters that we see in this exhibition. But to add even a little bit more context, discrimination and racism has literally been written into state laws. And that has happened since the time of slavery. Black people during the time of slavery, whether they were slaves or not, were faced a death penalty for crimes that would not have been eligible if, if th that, that crime was committed by a white person. In the decades after the Civil War, lynchings really started to skyrocket, becoming a terrorizing form of extrajudicial executions that were carried out largely against Black people. Uh, during this time, and I think this is where we start to think about like how images are used, you know, lynchings were often a celebration commemorated by postcards, you know, this imagery pushed out into our communities um, to further terrorize and, and using those symbols to terrorize folks. Um, and I think as, as lynching started to decline in the first part of the 20th century, executions by hanging or legal lynchings as uh, some of us have called them, have became much more common, um, really replacing lynching as a tool of racial violence. Um, and now it's implemented by the state in a, in a much, in a, in a legal way. Um, and just looking from 1910 to 1950, 75% of those people executed in the South uh, were Black, even though Black people were really less than one quarter of the South's population. And as the death penalty was reinstated after, uh, in, in the 70s and 1976, this systemic bias has not gone away. 
Um, we continue to see people of color disproportionately being represented, in, not just on the in the death penalty, but in our criminal legal system, from policing to incarceration to execution. Uh, and so I think there are time and time again, there are so many examples of how people of color are disproportionately represented and swept up into the criminal legal system and, and part of and being executed and, and on death row. Yeah, you know, Gary, after being falsely accused and convicted of murder and given the death penalty, how do you personally feel about the criminal justice system in this country now? Well, <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of hard to basically put in words because I not only been a victim of the system itself, I come from a very poor family. My father was a gas station, you know, a, a gas station attendant, and he worked it hard. And my mother was a, a housekeeper. And when this incident happened, they had to work hard to try to hire an attorney. And, and unfortunately, they were not financially, you could say, well off where they could get a qualified, a good attorney. And they got one of the worst. At that time, an attorney, many people felt an attorney was an attorney who can who can who was who was criminally trained to fight any, you could say, any kind of charge or whatever. But later on, my family found out that the attorney they hired was a divorce attorney. Never tried a criminal case in his life, especially not a capital uh, offense case. And having to experience the hardship of what my family went through, my mother and father. And knowing that I was personally a victim of it, I knew right there that something was seriously wrong with the system itself. And having to be on debt row with men who come from economically depressed background as similar as mine. I realized that something was seriously wrong with the system itself because I was around men of color, men who come from the rural areas of Louisiana, men who come from the, you could say the cities like New Orleans and Baton Rouge and Lafayette, but lived in the worst neighborhoods where the economy was, was basically in its deficit. And, and also having to experience the racism while in prison and knowing that I was not only discriminated and, and persecuted because of a crime I didn't commit, but also having to experience the racism of guards who felt strongly that I needed to die and created the worst conditions for me. And if it wouldn't have been for the prisoners themselves, most likely I wouldn't even be here today to express myself and what I went through. So I feel that the, you know, that the criminal justice system is, is basically is, is, is inadequate, it is decayed, and, is, and it is basically is, is outdated. And that it need to be, many people say reformed. How many times have we have to reform the criminal justice system before it go back to its corrupt ways? You have to change the criminal justice system. You have, to, you have to throw away the old model of the criminal justice system and come up with something fair and just. Why not ad adopt the models of the European countries? They value the people that they per that they that they are uh, prosecute. They don't do them well, discard them like trash. They reform these people, they rehabilitate these people. They give these people second chances. They make them, they work with them to become the best of themselves. But here in America, automatically you are criminalized and also you are persecuted in the, in, the, in the worst way. If you're not given a death penalty, then you are sentenced to life with no possibility of ever getting out of prison. I am a prime example of it. Well, you also um, accepted, uh, uh, a deal short of exoneration to finally get out of prison for a crime you didn't commit. So how does, how does that make you feel? You know, 
I was adamant about fighting it to the last breath of my body. But you know, when going to prison, you have that zeal, you have that drive to struggle and to fight. But when you lose family, start off with your, grand, with your grandparents, and then you lose your father and your mother, and the support, the family support, go to adrenaline, I mean, excuse me, you know, go to uh, 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 dissipating. It has you wondering whether you're gonna perish in prison, whether this is gonna be your fate. And during the time that I was in prison, never once did any, uh, any uh, 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 official in St. Charles Parish ever approach me about dealing with me about this case. Never once, but when when middle decision came now and have an opportunity to talk to the prosecutor and to hear him express his compassion and the way he felt that how my case was dealt with at the time, dealing with a reasonable individual and having to go through what I went through as a person, anger, bitterness, and hatred, I realized that that was an induced poison that I had to get rid of and and having to deal with so much in prison. And, and when it came down to options, I had to seriously think about those options. Did I have the years, that I had the time to continue to fight within a system that had gotten hardened until where it was in Angola, when they say life, they meant life. Or should I at least, you understand, know, as Albert Woodfox, a close mentor and friend of mine stated, why not make a freedom plea of getting out of prison instead of perishing in prison? So I felt that in the best interest of myself, family, and the victim's family, yes, I played guilty to manslaughter to get out of prison after 41 and a years, 41 and a half years of being in prison. I didn't feel right, I didn't feel good about it, but I had to make a decision what was in the best interest of me and everyone else. And that's, and, and, and that's, and I feel though that an individual should never be put in a situation where they got to make a decision or where they have to choose the lesser or whatever evil, especially when they're going against their innocence. You know, so, you know, it hurts me, but you know what? Life goes on and this gives me an opportunity to be able to participate in panels like this, be able to involve myself in just struggle and use my life experience as an example of letting people know that what happened to me can, and if nothing change, will happen to you. I have, oh yeah, go ahead, Mike. Carol, can I say for everybody who's listening, you are in the presence of a great human being and you just heard him speak. Thank you, Mike. Oh, thank you, Gary. Um, I have I've questions probably could go on for two days, but I also want to invite people to go into the chat. If you have questions for our panelists, um, feel free and go, go through, I'm sorry, not through the chat, through the Q&A. Go through the Q&A if you have any questions. Um, Mona, you had, you had um, this, this is in conjunction with an exhibition and you had mentioned earlier that, um, you know, we all agree that images are central, are essential for developing movements for social justice. It's actually the only thing that really, you know, it, it has to go hand in hand with the organizing is the art and the, and the, and the organizing. But many of the posters in the exhibition depict um, violence and trauma. And so what do you think about using images like this, um, you know, the strong images, for example, of lynching, there's many images of lynching. And yet many people are, are profoundly affected by this because it raises their own trauma, their own experiences. 
And so how do you how do you think exhibitions like this really can can balance the, the, the need to impart the information while respecting the individuals that'll be that'll be seeing this? Thanks, Carl. I, I really appreciate this question. It's something that I think a lot of us think about a lot as we do this work. We know that you know, political graphics and images are so important to inspire people to take action. And we also know that part of the story of the death penalty is its brutality and those brutal images. Uh, and so I, I'm, I'm, I don't actually know if there's the right or perfect answer, but I think as we put together images for campaigns, uh, for posters that we hope will inspire people. I, I think it's important for us to think about you know, who is putting together the images, who is at the table, are we bringing people who have been impacted by the death penalty to talk to us uh, about our image and participate in putting together these visual campaigns. Um, I, and, because I do wonder if and how we are perpetuating violence by the imagery that we use. And at the same time, like I said, I, it's important to both to tell the story in a very real way. Um, so for me, I think it's just it's important to be, to ask questions about who is part of the planning process, who is part of the choices, and what artists are we lift are we lifting up artists from the community. I think many of us know that you know there there are artists everywhere, um, and there are are many many people who are on death row who are incredible artists and. Uh, and so I, I think it's just as we put these images this out and we and we put posters together, I I I want us to to think about how we can be responsible and and bring people to the table to share in the conversation of what we're putting out for people to see. Do do any of you have a favorite poster you would like to, to share talk about, Mike? Yeah, I, um, actually, a friend of mine created that poster. It's it's the one that says uh, it shows a bunch of young boys in different uh, garb. One's a scout, as I recall. And it says, uh, sh shouldn't we be asking what went wrong? These are people who in later life committed a murder. And they were like we saw in Uvalde, Texas recently, they were children with a, with, with a possibility to have lives. And something went wrong in their lives that moved them to the point where they may, and I've been in this business too long to know whether or not somebody who was executed actually did the crime, um, but they may have committed a terrible crime. Um, but it's our job, it seems to me, if we're going to run, if we're going to be part of a society that actually values human life, uh, to figure out what we have to do to protect people from making those kinds of mistakes. Mike, I love that poster too. I, cause I just think it really gets at, at centering humanity in people and how important it is for us to both recognize, acknowledge, and help both people and communities heal from trauma. Because uh, I think we know, one of the things we know is that untreated trauma is one of those drivers of violence. And I, I think that poster really does, you know, bring to bear the impact of, you know, when people are failed by services, by the state, by whoever early in, in life. I want to share also, um, but first I want to acknowledge the people that are in the audience because there's so many leaders in our movement that are watching this and I want to just thank each of you for joining us and and I want to note especially Chuck Cohen is here watching. Uh, Chuck, his life was saved. He was on death row and, 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 and he was saved by the Furman decision. We're coming up on the 50th anniversary of the Furman decision, um, which took, which struck down all the death penalty laws and, and and took everybody off the death row and four states that wanted to have a death penalty to write new laws. And, and there's many more people we could call out, but, but uh, uh, you know, Chuck is one of those people. And, and, and just thank you for being here and for your comments, Chuck. Um, you know, one of the things that we did as we were um, this committee, and there's a few other people that are on this committee that aren't on the panel, um, we went through hundreds of posters over and over again to try to hone it down to what's in this exhibit. And, and for me, it's hard to pick just one that's a favorite. 
Um, but if I did have to pick one, it would actually be the series where we show the Colosseum in Rome lit up by the, the organization that does that as San Egidio um, in coalition with others in Rome. Uh, and, and they also do the, the Cities of Light campaign that's every year on November 30th, which is the anniversary of Tuscany becoming the first place in the world to abolish the death penalty. Um, so they have that relationship there. And, but for me, having worked on those campaigns, um, and I know this is true for others here, probably especially Mona, um, where we actually were there watching those final debates and it's, it's always a thrill when they pass your bill and then you get to celebrate. And to me, it's it, it, what makes it a favorite for me is it symbolizes the victory that's possible and the victories that are happening that are taking us on a path to abolition. Um, and, and, and it gives me hope. And that's that's why I want to pick that one as my favorite. Well, what else, what gives everybody here hope in, in, in dealing with this 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 literally life and death issue? What what gives what gives you hope, the, both the hope and the and the encouragement to continue doing the work that, that we're doing? I would like to chime in. <laughs> If you don't mind, is that when I went through this, when I was invited to be a part of the panel and the group, and having to see the posters, God, I mean, so many remind me of magazines and newspapers that I had, you know, read, who was championing the cause of people not only in the United States, but also around the world. And to know that you had people of like mind who felt strongly that how unjust the system was, not only here in America, but also internationally, that they were able to put their lives, their profession online to fight for what was right. That itself was inspiring, knowing that those very people, those very people was, was so committed into a way they didn't only limit their support locally and nationally, but also internationally, because I know many of those organizations who had championed the cause were staunch supporters who, who fought and supported me in my, and, and to save my life against the death penalty at that time. And knowing that they were, they were grassrooted organization. So, you know, reminiscing of all of that, it, you know, it made me, you know, it made me felt good that there are people like that that still, even today, steadfast and trying to change an unjust system by doing what's right. And that this is the only way that they're going to be able to change minds is to constantly get out there and fight, no matter how bleak things are, that we're going to be heard. You may not want to hear us now. But later on, you're going to see a poster. You're going to see a phrase. You're going to see something that's going to remind you that, hey, those people was fighting for the right thing. And, and you know, and here, my, my child or my, grand, or my grandchildren are now picking up that banner and moving it forward. And that's what I look at when I look at those posters from way back until now, that those are posters, those are relic of the struggle of the past. And those are something that we got to constantly show society that this is this is the beacon. That this is how people feel. They're all about, you know, being philanthropists and trying to make a difference of helping other people, no matter what of their economic backgrounds, no matter what of their racial and ethnicity. It's all about justice, and justice is work. Work justice is struggling for those. You understand that where they can feel good, but not only so much good, but where they can have something to live for, knowing that it's not always bad things. You got, you got many good people in the world and more than you have bad people in the world. So I just wanted to say, I, I was very impressed and moved by that. There's a couple of questions on uh, the chat. One of them is, what do you feel about uh, a life without parole? Well, I would like to, I would like to, well, go ahead on, Mike. I like it. You know. no, that's all right. You go, you go, Gary. 
you know, I would like to, uh, you know, I would like to deal with that. Is that, you know, it's 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 kind of like threading a needle when dealing with life without parole, because you know we're we're talking about someone's life on the line on death row, and when someone is adamant about I am innocent, listen to me, I am innocent, and and even those that are guilty. And, and, and facts proven, you know, that, that, that you can say the crime itself. Nonetheless, I'm going on. I just want to take a deal with an individual who have an option. Sometimes people play Russian roulette with other people's lives, and having you know having to wear choosing life or the death penalty. In most cases, yes, they would choose life over, you know, over having to be executed. And I would always feel that choose life because it gives you another day to fight. It gives you tomorrow, it gives you next week, it gives you next year to fight. You should never give up because when I had the death penalty, I knew my struggle wasn't over with. I was given a life sentence. Not, and I felt that any given day that I woke up, that was the day that was a marching order for me, that I had to fight, that I had to make sure that I let people know that even though I'm here serving the life sentence, I'm still fighting against an unjust cause. I'm still fighting to prove my innocence. And at the same time, I'm fighting for other people that's in prison along with me. So I feel, you know, it, it, you know, having to choose life or death, I mean, it's, I think it's a you know it's an individual cause, but you know that's to me it's like <laughs> that's something that <laughs> you know I would say that you would have to have a conversation with your family or your priests about what decision you want to make when it comes down to that. Mm -hmm. Did you want to add to that, Mike? Yeah, sure. I, I had a, a debate with a DA once. Um, in, on television and um, made all the arguments against the death penalty. And he, and then there was this pause for a commercial. So we were off camera. And he said, you know what, if you succeed and, uh, and get a, do away with the death penalty, we're gonna end up with life without parole. And then you're gonna go after life without parole. And I said, you're absolutely right. Life without parole means as far as I'm concerned, you give up hope. Now, Gary suggests you're, there's always hope, and God bless you for that, Gary. But when the, when the state says life without parole, it means you can never hope to get out of this prison as long as you are alive. And in my view, that's, uh, that's a, another death sentence. And I oppose it. And I think it's wrong. And I think what we have to do is find a way to make the maximum sentence something like what they do in Europe or in some of the other advanced countries, which is 25 years, maybe 35 years, call it 40 years if you want, with the possibility of parole, but that possibility has to be something you work to, um, work to gain, uh, work to your advantage. Um, but to, I don't, believe the, the, I don't believe the state has the right and should have the right to tell somebody that they will never see freedom again. I, I agree, Mike, and I might even move towards even more Absolutely. transformation. Sure. I mean, I, I think, right, the, the, the narrative out in the world is that justice is punishment, which is why we see legislators and policymakers leaning into the death penalty, life without parole, mandatory minimums, everything that can give you more and more time. And you know, I think part of the work of those of us doing organizing on the ground is also to shift how we think about justice. Uh, and instead of justice being punishment, justice being the presence of healing, accountability, and safety. That's, uh, that's a long road to go, um, but I think that that's, it, it's so critical for us to shift how we, how we talk about uh, punishment and accountability and violence. Um, so I, I think as part of our long, long, long work of generations, uh, that's one way that we need to, sh to shift entirely. I'll, I'll just add, you know, <laughs> It is a tool that 
you know, there are lots of politicians, lots of legislators who have voted for the death penalty, I'm sorry, for abolition, abolishing the death penalty because they knew that death in prison was even worse, or at least that it was there. That was their justification. I don't say that that's right. I certainly don't agree with it. I will say that one of the other people that's watching today is our colleague, uh, Charles Keith, whose brother is Kevin Keith, who is one day 13 days away from execution and his sentence, and he's innocent. Uh, see justice for Kevin Keith uh, on uh, .org on the webpage. Um, but he is still alive and fighting for his innocence because he got commuted to life without parole. The option was that or death. So there's a, a, a place where, it, like what Gary was saying, you still can have hope if you're still alive, right? Again, I don't agree with life without parole. There are some people as they presently exist who should never be free, but that doesn't mean that we have to not offer hope. And so I think we're all together on this in, in opposing the idea and, you know, being a realist and a person that's been a part of campaigns to end the death penalty, I also recognize where there's a where it becomes a valuable part of the conversation. Again, hard to have, hard to say, okay, that's what you're gonna get, but it's a reality. And I think in every state that has the death penalty, if you're not getting death, you're getting life without parole, death in prison. Again, don't agree with it, but that's part of the reality of today's criminal legal system. Well, we've come. Let I'm me look at yeah, yeah, please. The, in, in Norway, Anders Breivik, the man who killed seventy some people because he was a fascist and believed he had the right to do that, um, got a twenty-five year sentence for that's the the most sentence uh, they can give to uh, even one who murders number great numbers of people. But in Norway, they also have the possibility of adding on five years at a time if he doesn't show uh, that he is reformed or he has learned his um, learned better and come to a better place. So I, while I don't believe in, in life without parole, I do believe in the possibility that keeping somebody in prison may be necessary in some cases for the rest of their lives. But you have to, in my view, give them the opportunity to show that they have, as Gary used the term, rehabilitated themselves. Uh, um, I have some, some <laughs> many years ago, I was with a, a grouping, working with a group of people out of prisons and people out of institutions and people who were just uh, off the streets. And uh, the man who was running the organization was approached by a, by a uh, uh, social worker who said, you've done a wonderful job of rehabilitating these people. And it, he said, rehabilitating bullshit. These people have been, never been habilitated in the first place. And that's the problem. We are not taking the responsibility of seeing to it that people have the opportunity to, to, uh, to socialize themselves, learn what is necessary to live a meaningful, productive life. Well, that's, that's couldn't pick a better way of ending. Um, we, we actually have two short clips that I think I'm going to thank everyone and close and then anyone who can and wants to stay on for another one clip is five minutes one clip is a minute and a half to, to see them you're more than you're we, we invite you to we hope you will but I want to thank my the, the wonderful panel Mike Mona Gary Abe I mean you you were an amazing you were an amazing group to work with um, I think this is the first time we've had a committee that met every single week, and that was kind of, uh, I was surprised that everybody really was, really was willing to put that kind of effort into it, but I really appreciate it. Emily Seltzer, who's behind the CSPG logo, logo, um, you've just you've been great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank, you know, the, the Mercado, the all the folks at Mercado La Paloma and Esperanza Community Housing for housing our exhibitions for, I think this is like the 10th or 11th year. We've had an ongoing partnership with them. Uh, everyone who donates posters of the Center for the Study of Political Graphics, we couldn't do it without you. And, um, and of course our funders, the, the Department of Cultural Affairs and the City of Los Angeles, the Getty Grant Foundation and the um, Los Angeles County Department of Cultural Affairs. So we are, we are very much appreciative. Um, 
can come onto our website, politicalgraphics.org. If you don't have the events written down, you can find them there. The exhibition is up through the end of July. And we are now going to show these two, the two video clips. I think I'm gonna reverse them, Emily, if you can do that. If you can't do what's easiest, but there's a five minute clip from a, a, a feature length documentary film on um, uh, 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 Kevin Cooper. And then there's a one and a half minute film about eliminate, uh, uh, organizing to eliminate the death penalty in Tennessee that, that Abe was involved with, um, with putting together. So those we were gonna end with there and but we're, we're gonna keep filming and keep, and keep on. And if you have any contacts, any questions, um, we'll do our best to answer them. Thank you very much. Stay safe and stay creative. <laughs> I'm currently right now in a cage, four and a half feet wide, 11 feet long. A cage I've been in for over 38 years here at San Quentin Prison. I got a stay of execution, but I came within three hours and 42 minutes of being strapped down to that gurney and injected with lethal poison. This horrible, horrible massacre of a family in Chino Hills, California happened on June 5th of 1983. It was uh, a scene out of Helter Skelter or the Manson murders. The sole surviving victim identified the three assailants as three white or Mexican men. At first they indeed were looking for several white guys, but then they found this black man who kind of fit their mental image of what a, a killer would look like. And they thought, ah, that's it. When Kevin Cooper was arrested and tried, the atmosphere was racially charged. Killed a nigger, electrocuted him. The people were actually standing outside the courthouse, carrying these signs, screaming at us. That was scary. We kept wondering, is it safe for us to even be here? But we knew we had to be there for Kevin. I think the more fundamental problem for the justice system was an implicit bias that infused the entire process. We have a system that treats you better when you are rich and guilty than when you are poor and innocent. Everybody knows, even the people who promote it know that it's racist in application. It's only used against the poor and the poorly defended. It makes mistakes. It kills, it kills the guilty as well as the innocent. There are 167 men and women who have been tried and convicted and sentenced to death and ultimately have been found to be innocent and cleared and freed. Kevin's been incarcerated since 1983. He's been on death row since 1985. Came you know, hair's breadth from being executed in, uh, in 2004. I was in a, a death chamber waiting room. Uh, they stripped me down butt naked like a slave on an auction block. And they examined my body from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet and every part in between. And my life was on the clock every minute that ticked by. You know, it's just an unreal, surreal, type experience, but it is real. You know that these people are not playing with you. They are going to murder you. When Kevin's execution was stayed only three hours and 42 minutes before he was going to be executed, the Ninth Circuit granted him the right to file a new habeas corpus petition to try to show that he was innocent. There's just too much about this case that simply demands clarity demands a new investigation. He's the man convicted of four gruesome murders in the early 1980s. Governor Gavin Newsom has now opened an independent investigation into the case. People will understand that there's a lot more to sentencing people to death than just finding a murderer and saying that person should die. It will demonstrate that we have had a man in prison on death row for over 30 years who did not commit the crime and it will be a thunderclap that will undercut the existence of the death penalty in California and will begin the process of ending the death penalty in the United States. 
And if we get this in and we get this exposed, I have to believe that I will take my place out there with you in the fight against oppression. That's what I want. That's what I need. This is sacred ground. It is tortured ground. And on Thursday night, it's going to be a place of murder. A murder that doesn't have to happen. The one that has happened now over and over and over again under a supposed pro-life governor that could stop any of these murders with a phone call. There is no redemption with the death penalty. There is no hope with the death penalty. We pray that Governor Bill Lee will live up to what he writes on Twitter. What do we want? Justice! When do we want it? Now! Christians, we are the problem. The death penalty would not stand a chance in America if it weren't for the support of Christians. 95% of executions are happening in the Bible Belt. So we are raising up our voices, right? To stand up for mercy, to stand up for life. We won't be silent anymore. Everybody say somebody's hurting our children and it's gone over. Thank you, everyone. And um, and you can you can email to the center, and we can also we will, we will forward any of your uh, any of your anything that you want to ask any of our panelists. We will forward that. Um, and keep on keep on trying to make the world a better place. Thank you, Carol. Thank you all. Thank you, Carol. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. And uh, keep uh, um, Frank Atwood in your prayers. Uh, he's scheduled to be executed on the 8th in Arizona. Mm -hmm. Take action um, with the death penalty um, alternative, uh, alternatives for the death penalty alternatives for Arizona is the state group. And of course, petitions on deathpenaltyaction.org. The struggle never ends. Let all get involved. Okay, we're, we're going to, I think we're just going to, great comments, great panel, and a, an issue that needs, needs every bit of, every bit of support that we can, we can find. Thank you all. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.